storm. Anyone else we need to keep in mind? Tony, would you lead us in a word of prayer and we'll get we'll get started. Y'all have always done an excellent job, and I thank you for this being a a two-way class instead of a lectureship. I'm not near smart enough to, or good enough of a speaker for this to be a a monologue. So y'all, please feel free to to make comments as we go or or ask questions, and we'll get the questions to somebody that that can answer them. General Epistle of James, I have always enjoyed studying the book of James, and when I get asked to teach a class on the spur of a moment or or something, I usually go to James chapter 4. You know, sometimes I'm kind of hard-headed, and it takes somebody being plain-spoken to kind of get my attention. And when I read through the, and I've told y'all before, I tend to like assign personalities to, to writers. I kind of, as I'm reading a book, you know, I may even get a mental image uh, of whether it be Paul or, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, try to kind of get a mental image of that person standing there talking to me. And um, by the way, they, they use the langu- language, even though it's been through translations. Uh, you kind of get the feeling that James was just a, today, you know, I would think of him as being a, a good country preacher. Just He's plain spoken. Um, one of my favorite verses is the last verse, chapter 4. Him, to knoweth, do it, him that knoweth to doeth good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Hard to get any plainer than that. Right? I mean, that's just... Here it is. So, like I say, sometimes I think in, in my case, I need the plain spokenness sometimes of, of uh, somebody who's writing like James. Now, the first time I studied James, and this is not to give a plug to last to leaders, really, but in a way it is, um, it was the book of study one year for lads, the Bible Bowl, and I was teaching the class across the hall for our teenagers. And a lot of them made it the the centurion of scriptures that year because you could memorize the entire book because the book of James only has 104, 105 verses. I didn't add them up this morning, but you could memorize the book of James, which was also our Bible bowl book, like I said, and, you know, it was your centurion of scriptures as well. So I, I guess that was where I really kind of delved into it a little deeper for myself. Uh, Who was James? Half-brother of Jesus. How many half-brothers did Jesus have that we know of? Four. Who were they? (laughs) 
James, I guess you pronounce it Hoseas or Joseas, Simon and Judas. They're listed in uh, Matthew 13, 55 as being the, the earthly brothers, half-brothers uh, of Jesus. Um, Paul also refers to this James as uh, uh, a brother of Jesus in Galatians. So the thought is this was... Uh, that this is the, the James that was the half-brother of Jesus, James the Just, he was also called. Um, what else we know about him outside of what is written in the book of James? I'm talking about things that you might pick up from Josephus or, or secular history, other secular history. He was an elder. He's one of the leaders of the Church of Jerusalem. There was one, uh, one place I read that he spent so much time on his knees praying that his knees had obvious large calluses that um, you know like a, almost like a, a knuckle joint of a camel that uh, that was how much time he spent in prayer and you get to, to thinking uh, uh, being a devout man um, um, how was it he supposedly died, again, being secular history? Anybody ever read anything about his, his death, supposedly? Beg your pardon? He was um, supposedly either the roof of the temple or the high, a high part of the temple, a high window. And he was surrounded by devout Jews who... Um, who uh, were trying to force him um, to denounce Christ. And when he refused, he was forced out the window. And I've read that he died from the fall. I've also read, again, all this being you know, secular history, that the fall did not kill him, and so they stoned him at the foot of the temple wall. So a devout man, a man who, if that is true, maintained his faith till his death and uh, again you know I, I've told you I kind of get I don't know if they're weird thoughts or just just thinking in general you know I, I got a brother a lot of y'all have earthly brothers can you think of how hard it would be to accept the fact of somebody you grew up playing and running around with being part of the Godhead and accepting that and then, you know, really becoming one of his followers. I know that would, uh, I would have a hard time thinking of my brother that way. Uh, you know, we used to get into some meanness and all, but still, uh, have you ever just given that a thought? How, you know, think of your earthly brother and, and how hard it would be to accept them to be deity and for him to become a, a devout follower of, of his half brother. So, anyhow, just some, some random thoughts before we really get into the lesson of the morning. Um, I think Brother Mike got down through the thought that starts. Uh, verse 13 through 16. I don't think, I think we stopped, best I noted, about verse 15. So we'll read 13 through 16. Let no man, if I can read, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, or my version in parenthesis says full grown, bringeth forth death. Do not err, or again in parenthesis, be deceived, my beloved brethren. We all, uh, I think it's pretty much a, a natural tendency, isn't it, to, uh, you get, caught up in something to start playing the blame game you know nothing's ever our fault seems like always find somebody to uh, to put it off on 
Um, when's the first recorded instance of that? Very, very beginning, first man. When you have uh, in the Garden of Eden, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't Adam's fault, it was this woman. It wasn't this woman's fault, it was this serpent. So, you know, it's just passing the, passing the blame trying to. Now, when is the first instance that we read of of somebody trying to blame God? That's it. That's exactly it. Because not, not only did Adam say, you know, it was her, it was this woman whom you gave me. So, Adam... It's her fault, and don't forget, God, you gave her to me. You know, so the, the blame game started right then, and, and the funneling fault back to God, same, same time. Is that true? Does God tempt us? No, no. It's right there in the, in the, the verse 14. It's when you're drawn away. It's when you become weak and are drawn away from God and drawn into your own lust that the temptations uh, start to claim us. When lust, when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So you have, when you fall away and you give way to the lust, the lust brings forth sin, and what does the sin yield? Spiritual death. So, the whole, it, it all comes back to us. You know, it's the old saying, if you point a finger at somebody, you've got three pointing back at yourself. That's where we have to, that's where we have to start. And it's one of the great, you know, it's one of the problems we have is uh, uh, a lack of self-examination sometimes the lack of uh, looking inward to see where the problems lay. So, thoughts or comments on the first four verses? Right. In every case, you know, God allows us to be tempted. He allowed Satan to tempt Jesus. Um, it's our weakness that's the problem. Any other thoughts? Okay. 17 through 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begot he us with word of truth that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. And I have some notes here from... I don't know when, several years ago, I'm sure, when we studied this last in here, where it said for every gift, every good gift, the first, the first gift mentioned in verse 17, that Mike made the point that that was the act of giving. And of every perfect gift, that that gift there mentioned was the gift itself. So I'm not sure how, how we broke that down. That's just some notes, I guess, from going back to the original language. That, that Mike brought out. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. All gifts are from above. Cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness. It says, cannot, can be no variation, and neither a shadow is cast by turning, or neither a shadow of turning. What is meant by Father of lights? Right. 
And the analogy he's using here is you have the the father of lights. Of course, he was the father of all lights. But the thought is he's actually talking about the the literal lights, the the solar system, stars and and sun, and how there's no variation in that, neither shadow of turning. In In parentheses it says, neither shadow that is cast by turning. So, um, again, going back, every good gift and every perfect gift uh, comes from Father. Uh, even, you know, the, the thought again being that uh, the evil things we have are, are not from God. Uh, in the ancient Greek, I'm told, or, or read, that where it says Father of lights, that uh, the word the is left out. That the word the would have been in the original language, Father of the lights. So, <clears throat> of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Thoughts on that verse? What does it mean to be first fruits? Be the best. Be the best uh, of the, the fruits. Um, it also, the point you could take there is he initiated our path to salvation, right? He did the, the, the giving of the word, the word of truth, so that the path to our salvation was given to us uh, by God. Any other thoughts or comments? Verse 19 and 20. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You know, you, you stand up here and you try to kind of expound on some of this, and it's really it's kind of hard to break it down any simpler than that. Um, slow to, <clears throat> swift to hear. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Um, you know, the old saying is that we've got two eyes and two ears, but one tongue. Uh, ought to be twice as likely to, to hear and see than to speak. And James gets further as we get further into the book, more about the, the problems of, of the tongue. your brain. Well, that's true. And, and the, the extra step we have here is the wrath, slow to wrath. Um, you know, I think all of us and, and certainly understand that, you know, I ought to be a student in this class, not a teacher. Um, Temper can get you in trouble. Uh, like Mike says, blurting things out just you know uh, before you, you process the thoughts. Now, I, I can think I can speak for myself. It's, I've got better at that as I've gotten older. Uh, you realize a lot of times that, uh, hey, you know, 10 years ago, I jumped to a conclusion and would have said something I shouldn't have or would have regretted saying. And like Lynn said, had to, once those words are out, you know, you can't take them back. So then it becomes having to make things right after the fact. Uh, does anything come good come out of uh, wrath, uh, of pitching a fit? No. No. Uh, and, and, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe I, I think of things I've seen, and, and maybe they're not, maybe they're atypical, maybe... But 
so much of the world has changed like that. Uh, I think about athletics and all. Coaches can't say on the field or do on the field what they could do 30 years ago. Uh, you know, I'd come home with welts on my legs from whistle straps and stuff like that. You can't do that. And, and so you kind of learn, I guess, had a lot of fits pitched at me. Uh, and if folks thinking, you know, they were driving you to do better. But uh, this day and time, especially, it, 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 always, but even more so, I think now, you really got to watch what you say and who you say it to, and you just, you're better off to hear and to think before you, you go to throwing things. Um, verse 20, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You know, the only guy who gets anything out of uh, pitching a fit or, or the wrath having a, uh, is the guy doing it to his own, to his own desires, yeah, or maybe he? You know, you think about uh, just people we've all known that uh, they thought the only way to get things accomplished was to to throw things or yell and scream. And uh, in hindsight, that was just made them out to be a small person when you look back at it. I had a, I used to work for a plant manager that, uh, you know, every staff meeting was that way. You know, stuff getting thrown in the conference room and, and what have you. And that was, that was no good for anybody. And I think word finally got back to his bosses and he was put on a permanent assignment to a plant in China. I agree. It, um, and uh, like I said, I think that gets better with age. I, I hope it does. You know, 15 years ago when I couldn't find something, I wanted to know who got it. And now it's where did I put it? So, because... Uh, Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments? It's, it's just, uh, it's always, and I'm going to say this when I'm not trying to, re I mean, it's in the Bible. It's not Andy saying it, but, but swift to hear, swift to see, slow to speak, slow to wrath. It's just, that's just good behavior, good common sense. We should, we should all know that by now. Any other thoughts? Verse 21. 
Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity. I think some versions say overflowing of naughtiness or wickedness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So we've got to lay apart filthiness, naughtiness, or wickedness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. Um, any thoughts or comments on that? Basically, it's just laying aside all impurities. Uh, laying aside the ways of the world. What will, the, uh, what will the Word do? Again, this was given to us as a path to our salvation. Freely given. Save our souls, right? It's the path we have to save our souls. Um, Yeah, to, it says to meekly receive it. And, and um, again, this is what this is saying, and, and we're going to get a little further into it before the end of the chapter. Um, it's on us. It, we're told God gives us the word, and if we accept it, it will. it's the path for getting our salvation. So it, it's all on us. We can't blame we can't blame our uh, doing worldly things or evil things on God. God uh, allows us to be tempted, but, but God doesn't tempt us. You know, it's through our own departure from God, our own leave, leaving God, our own going into the world that that happens. Free will. Free will. Yes, ma'am. So it's, it's, it's on us to, you know, I, I love Nancy to death. I honestly believe that I wouldn't have any problem giving my life to save hers. But she can't save me. You know, she, she makes it easier for me to do the right things. I can't account for her come judgment day. It's all on me. In her case, it's all on her, right? Every individual sitting here, it's on you. To, uh, to determine where you spend eternity. Thoughts or comments? Y'all's, y'all's uh, this, and I, I've said it and thanked y'all for it before, but the comments that y'all have is, to me is what makes this class go. So they're always appreciated. 22 through 25, if there's nothing else. <clears throat> Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whose looketh... But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. There, there was a problem in the New Testament church times with the teaching of Paul being misrepresented. Now, this, what I'm about to say depends on when James was written. We have some folks uh, talk of James being written as the first book in the New Testament written. Some talk of it being written closer to his death in the mid 80s, 60s. But he seems to be addressing whether it was a, a, a reaction to some of Paul's teachings being taken out of context or whether he's just teaching it stand alone of uh, folks taking some things Paul had said to mean that uh, basically faith only, that uh, you didn't have to live the word. So 
in, the, in this time, what was a disciple? How would you define a disciple? Yeah, a follower. Yeah, it, it's not just a hearer, but somebody who, who follows those teachings, who, who tries to, to carry out those teachings. And that's what we're talking about here. You know, Tony, uh, y'all know he, he mows a lot of grass. Well, he can own a lawnmower and a truck and a trailer, but that doesn't make the grass any shorter, does it? You know, you got to go cut it. You know, several of you ladies are, uh, are uh, good with needle and thread, seamstresses. Well, owning the equipment, the cloth, doesn't put a dress on anybody, does it? You know, you've got you've to execute it. So that's what we're talking about here, not hearers only. You've got to be doers of the word. What is the analogy about the mirror? What does that mean? Yeah. You know, uh, I can't think of an example, and it's probably better that I can't. But we all know folks that, uh, you know, like the Fonz used to do on Happy Days, you know, look in the mirror and then throw his hands out and exclaim, you know, he wasn't going to touch what he saw because it was perfect. Y'all remember that or am I that old? Um, you know, Fonzie would, you know, and go A or however it went. Well, that's, uh, that's somebody that uh, doesn't see the improvements that need to be made, right? Uh, if you look, it talks about uh, doers of the word and hearers, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Uh, like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Well, the thought there is with natural face would be maybe a face of a man who's been out working. You know, sweat, dirt, what have you. And um, instead of uh, correcting the problems he sees in the mirror... He, uh, he just sees past him, I guess you would say. Uh, Beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way straightway, forgetting what manner of man he was. So he looks in the mirror, and instead of doing the self-examination to, to see, hey, here's the improvements, here's what I need to, to do, he just he forgets what he sees and, and thinks, hey, no improvement can be made here and goes on his way. Well, that's, uh, that's forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we can't just be hearers. We can, uh, uh, we've actually got to, to execute the plan, right? Yeah. We've got to be doers. We can't just come and sit and listen to, to Mike two or three times on a Sunday and, uh, and that be all, all there is to it. Comments? Y'all gonna have to start talking. That's, uh, you know, you, you sit back and look, and, and uh, to me, that, that's maybe, and, and it is, it's just human nature, but there, there's, you can start naming, and I don't mean to go off on a big tangent. You can as being a problem with us as Christians in the year 2022. And I'm not going to say it's any different than Christians in the year 1922. Um, but that's got to be one of them. It's a lack of self-examination. We can see the fault in everybody else. But we're, we sometimes are, are tough, tougher on other folks than we are ourselves. And we lack the self, self-examination. You know, what do, I, what do I need to be doing different? What do I need to be correcting? You know, it's... But it's always 
easier to see in other people than it is to look at yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's, it's the human nature of it. It is. It's just easier to see faults than everybody else. Um, and again, I think that's something that comes with age too, is an ability to do that a little better, to, to examine yourself. Um, anyhow. We've got to learn to do that because, again, you know, you may have uh, you may have people all around you that you can see all the fault in their lives, and you may you may wish and want for them to to correct those, or you may have to put some distance between yourselves and them. However, you have to handle those situations. But the thing you got to remember. It's like we said a while ago, come judgment day, we're only speaking for one person. And you've got to make sure that uh, your slate's clean. No. You scared me there to start with. I agree. I, I, y'all correct me if you feel different about this. I think it's gotten harder through time for us to have heart-to-heart -heart talks with brothers and sisters. Um, not as, I mean, as, as time goes on, not necessarily the age we have as individuals, but uh, it just seems harder at least for me, to try to correct somebody else because it's uh, like they're just seemingly more offended, more easily offended. Than. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you do. You know, I think, and I'm, again, not as good at this as I need to be, but when you see fault with a brother, you, 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 there is an obligation, I think, to, to bring that up. And that's difficult. Um, there's, just, there's a lot of different ways that you can bring it up. Too. Right. It depends on the heart of the person you're talking. I mean, uh, agree completely that there's a right way and wrong way to approach it, but you've also got to be able to read that person because it's two personalities talking to each other. Right. The church, even your presence, a lot of times, right. will prick their hearts. Uh, I know one time in my life, I had a little old lady. She's the sweetest thing. I grew up with, you know, with her, and you know, she 
she saw me one day in the grocery store. And I wasn't going to church or doing anything, doing my own thing. And she, she said, she said, you know, asked me how I was doing. and said, she's glad to see you. Gave me a hug and she said, uh, come on back to church. A few weeks later, I started showing up. Yeah. So, you know, what we do around him is important. Well, and right, and, and, and I've... I've known of cases where somebody would go out of their way to go to see somebody and, and maybe do that one day a week, then increase their frequency and never mention church. And just the presence and the friendship brought that person back. So. Mm-hmm. They don't go anywhere. But they were so impressed with a church that really wasn't even associated with Floyd Jones. He was a member of the church. He didn't go here. That these ladies were willing to come here and serve them a meal. Uh, we've got some prospects out there. Well, Nancy helped with that. Uh, and one of several, not to point her out, but she made the comment that I guess as they were leaving, one of them said that he would like to visit here. And, uh, you know, you, you put a lot of work into, uh, the ladies did, like you say, into helping a family through a time like that uh, under no obligation to the, to the family. And, you know, just hearing one person say, say something like that is, uh, you know, sufficient pay easily. So... Right. I don't think you guys had any ideas where that was going to go. I mean, you know, they were doing it out of love, being a caring, the women that we have here that work so hard and are caring. Well, I, you know, you could you could say, well, why are we even doing that? Because none of them came here, none of them attended here. But to get some some folks that you maybe just opened the door to their heart a little bit is uh, was worthwhile. I think anyone would agree with that. Any other thoughts? 26 and 27. If any man among you seem to be religious and bringeth not and bridleth not his tongue, he deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Verse 26 basically says, if you don't have control of your tongue, then um, your religion is in vain. I can't improve on that. That's pretty much there. Verse 27 is often criticized because some folks say James is leaving out a whole lot of stuff, uh, a whole lot of things that we need to do uh, to be Christians. Well, that's not what James is saying. James is simply emphasizing a couple of items we need to do. Um, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now that last sentence, that's a full-time job for me. Yeah, that's, that's, that's you talk about an all-encompassing statement. Uh, to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Uh, that's a task. So, any thoughts and comments? I think, did I hear the first bell? Any thoughts, comments on the last, last two verses? I did read, you don't see the word religious all that often in the New Testament. And I did read one commentator that said you don't see that word all that often because it usually had a negative connotation. Because usually you were talking about somebody that seemed to be religious or, you, you know, that wasn't a, a true follower. 
that was just a religious person maybe for namesake, for show. nothing else we will fetch some youngins I do appreciate the comments if it wasn't for the comments I'd die up here so <clears throat>